Uh, before I start today, I want to talk uh, today and uh, Thursday uh, with you all about deception uh, in journalism um, and in news, news reporting in particular. But before we begin, there was a th there's a piece that ran over the weekend um, that I happened to notice that I thought I would share with you just because it, it touches on some of the same issues uh, that we've been talking about here uh, already. Um, and I don't know if any of you saw it, but the, the San Francisco Chronicle over the weekend um, wrote a piece about the judge in the Prop 8 case. You all know about this case. This is the, uh, there's a federal challenge to the constitutionality of Prop 8, which as you'll recall was the vote to outlaw uh, gay marriage in California. Um, and the Chronicle over the weekend ran a piece. It's, a, it's in a federal court in San Francisco, and it's gotten a lot of attention on issues of televising the trial and whatnot. Um, the Chronicle ran a piece over the weekend saying that the judge in that case, Judge Walker, is gay. Um, that this is known to his friends and associates. Uh, by the way, I can't testify to it one way or another, but assuming the Chronicle's true, um, they reported that he's gay and that it's a, sort of an openly known fact at the courthouse in San Francisco. Um, and I just was curious whether any of you had a reaction to that. I mean, it obviously has some of the same echoes of what we talked about with respect to Oliver Sippel, the guy who saved Ford's life. But here you have a case where the issue of sort of homosexual identity is obviously at the core of the case. Should it matter um, that the judge in that case is gay? Does anyone have a, yeah? Well, that's like saying that none of the Supreme Court justices should be women when discussing abortion. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it, the only thing I, I would agree, except that this pushes it a little further in the sense that it's not an act about him being gay. It's the fact of his identity. Um, does that make a difference? I mean, if, it, if this were a case about separation of church and state, would the religious affiliation of a judge matter? If it were a race case, would the race of the judge matter? I mean, what's different, of course, is in a race case, you could tell what the race of the person was, presumably, where you can't. Yeah? But then, isn't that like saying that if he were straight, he'd be more likely to rule against? Well, like yeah. Against and, that's, and that sort of goes to your point, too. I had so the same reaction. Like, okay, right. Exactly right. It's the same argument, or would be in reverse, I would guess. Yeah. Anyone else? What other thoughts do people have on it? Yeah. <clears throat> Right. Excellent question. Um, my understanding, first of all, most federal cases are assigned by what they call the wheel. And as far as I know, and the, the, the story does not make, in fact, the story indicates that he just got it by chance. Um, so I don't think he did anything uh, to get it. By the way, that would be an issue, whether he were straight or gay or conservative or liberal. If someone, if a judge went out and got a case, uh, you would presume that they had some reason for doing it. Um, yeah, I mean, any other thoughts? I'm, I'm curious. What about the reporting of it? What if this judge, the judge is quoted not quoted in the piece, he's referred to in the piece as having refused to comment. Um, if the judge asked you not to run that story and you're a reporter, what would you do? Yeah. If he asked me not to run, then I'd find it particularly newsworthy. <laughs> right. It's a good point. Right. He might actually back you into writing it if he did. Um, I mean, I, there, one of the questions with, with cases like this, and it's certainly the case in Simple, too, is how do you really know? I mean, all really that Herb Cain and his people knew with respect to Oliver Sipple is that Sipple went to a bar, a gay bar. That doesn't necessarily mean that he's gay. Judge Walker, how do I know? I mean, how, how do the Chronicle reporters really know? Even if it's sort of an openly known or assumed fact, it's hard to know. And it's hard to know whether the judge's or the person's desires are relevant or not. Yeah. I think that, um, I mean, it makes the story and bringing it, but it's really like nobody's business because whether it's it's a known fact to certain people, like I didn't know, you know. And I didn't know. Yeah, you <laughs> right. didn't know, and so they're exposing it to a, a mass media rather than a, a few people they knew. Like, of course, you can't hide every relationship you have. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it really doesn't make, like the only reason that they made it so newsworthy is because of that fact of, of who we chooses to spend his time. And, and yet, you wouldn't make the same argument, right, if it were about the ideology of the judge. If the judge were, you know, a known uh, Christian conservative uh, who was handling the case on gay marriage, it would be less about identity and more about politics. And yet, there would, we would consider that a relevant fact for public discussion, right? I mean, we'd be, we'd be talking about the fact that, in either direction, if this were a, you know, a, a gay liberal activist who got this case, or a you know a known Christian conservative who got this case, we would talk about. It. So really, what we're talking about here is isolating your views from your identity, or one's views from one's identity, and then it, is the identity of, in and of itself something that is newsworthy? Yeah. Well, if he's a good judge, he puts himself aside when deciding something goes by the Constitution. So mm -hmm. it, in, in ideally, it shouldn't matter. Right. 
I mean, I suspect already there's a quote in this piece. First of all, the, the parties are quoted as saying it doesn't matter to them. Um, but the party, one of the lawyers or one of the spokespeople for the, uh, uh, for the pro Prop 8 side is quoted already as saying that they're already agitated with the judge for having wanting to, op he, he's the one who wanted to televise this trial. So they already feel that he's made a decision that indicated a predisposition against them. Now, they don't attribute it to his identity, but it's a reminder that uh, the decisions that judges make are not always you know, so impartial or so objective as to be you know, removed from the area of predisposition. I mean, the judges make decisions that are subject to second guessing. Yeah. I feel like judges are under the same kind of ethical rules as reporters in some ways that we're supposed to acknowledge our biases up front and not write about ones that we perceive to be affecting us. Mm -hmm. If he thought it was going to affect him, then he shouldn't have taken the case. If he's taking it, it means he can't be objective. Mm -hmm. Right, and they, they I, I don't know whether he talked to them about this. Although, interestingly, it goes back to, to your point earlier, like, would we assume that a judge who is heterosexual should disclose that to the parties uh, in a case like this? I mean, it's a, it, it, is, it does have embedded, the, the question of whether it's newsworthy has embedded in it the notion that there is something different about that, and that, that one's homosexuality would affect one more than one's heterosexuality would. So it is a strange, um, I mean, it's what, a lot of these cases on outing, and this is not, I don't know whether this is properly thought of as outing, but a lot of the outing debates in journalism turn on this unspoken premise that there's something different about gayness as opposed to homosexual or heterosexuality. Um, in any case, I, I mentioned it only because I happened to see it this weekend and it was so close to the simple case that I thought I would put it all in front of you. Um, all right, with that, let me move on to uh, the topic for the week, uh, deception. Um, um, let me start by saying it's obviously hard to mount a kind of full body defense of deception uh, in the context of journalism. I mean, we are, as I've talked about many times, uh, and as many of you wrote about uh, in your exams, we are, you know, the whole business of journalism is built on the idea that we're uncovering and reporting the truth. And it, it's hard in that context to lie in order to get the truth. Um, there's a Bradley, I don't know if, if those of you who've read the, the chapter uh, for this week already, um, you have come upon this quote from Ben Bradley, who writes, uh, who wrote many years ago, in a day in which we are spending thousands of man hours uncovering deception, we simply cannot deceive. How can newspapers fight for honesty and integrity when they themselves are less than honest in getting a story? When cops pose as newspaper men, we, are, we get goddamn sore, quite properly so. So how can we pose as something we're not? Um, so that's Bradley's view of it. By the way, that has not always been Bradley's view of it. Um, and I would uh, point out one quibble, and it's, uh, it's with no uh, joy that I would want to argue with Ben Bradley, but um, uh, his, his comparison to cops posing as newspaper men, uh, suggesting that that's sort of the equivalent of newspaper people engaging in deception, I think is a little misleading uh, in the sense that when police officers pose as newspaper people, which I'm going to assume happens not very often, but um, they, that creates a special kind of danger to news people um, because uh, anyone who's been involved in covering a big and sort of chaotic event, of, for instance, the riots, which I was involved in covering in 92, it would have been dangerous for journalists who were covering the riots to be perceived as police officers uh, because there was so much anger toward police officers. Um, so that it's not really true that if a journalist engages as an act of deception that it creates the same kind of danger as when a police officer engages in it. Nevertheless, I think that Bradley's point you know, kind of nicely frames the question, which is that we're in a truth-telling business. And if you're in a truth-telling business, how do you get off not you know, lying in order to get there? Um, now, that said, it is hard to deny, if you look over the course of history, um, journalistic and literary history, it is hard to deny that deception has on many occasions resulted in something quite positive for society. And I'm going to talk about several of them today. Um, there is an example from the text. A couple of these examples come from the text. Um, uh, back in the 70s, the Chicago Sun-Times, a couple of reporters from the Sun-Times uh, rented a tavern uh, or you know, bought a tavern and tried to spruce it up in Chicago in order to test uh, whether the, the inspectors were corrupt. Um, there's another example, again, which I'll talk about more in a couple minutes here, of a reporter uh, doing a series on, j uh, on prisons um, and going undercover to write about prisons from the inside. Um, there are the muckrakers uh, from the early 20th century, um, one of whom I'll talk about in a minute, 
who uh, in some cases posed as you know, working people or otherwise went undercover in order to, f to discover conditions and stockyards and meatpacking and, and other kinds of industries in order to, to give the public a really you know, vivid sense of what it was like. Um, and so if the results of these acts of deception um, are you know, crackdowns on public corruption, heightened public awareness uh, toward uh, working conditions, um, improved uh, food safety or improved labor laws, then I guess the, the ethical question is, is a small act of deception uh, ethical if, if it's in the context of a larger public good? Um, that's a hard question to answer and one that I would venture to say that no news organization answers perfectly or answers the same way in every case. Um, but it's, a, it's an important one and it's why I think that Bradley simply saying no uh, is a sort of inadequate response. And uh, it's exemplified by the fact that there was a time in his life where Bradley said yes. Uh, and so there's, this is not, not static either. And then finally, uh, at the conclusion of today, if we have time, uh, I'd like to raise one other question in the area of deception. And that's whether there's a difference between what is called passive deception and, and active deception, for lack of a better word. Uh, in other words, does it make a difference to simply, is there an ethical difference between not identifying yourself as a reporter and actively lying about who you are. Um, this is a situation that, that actually arises with some frequency. It certainly has arisen uh, a number of times in my life, um, where you may be part of a crowd or part of a group of people, um, and they'll, you may even be asked for your name. You can give your name and be telling the truth without giving what is the real truth, which is that you're a news reporter. And so then the question is, is that ethically different from actively lying about who you are in order to gain access to something or get some piece of information that you might not otherwise have gotten. All right, so with that as kind of the backdrop, let me talk about several cases um, in which this has been a big issue. Some, a couple of these, as I say, are in your text, although I'd like to talk about them a little more detail than the text does today. Um, the, the first and the biggest uh, sort of modern case testing the limits of, of legal limits anyway of deception is something called Food Lion, Food Lion versus ABC. Um, this is one that is mentioned in the book. Um, in early uh, 90, 1992, so what is that, 17, eight, 17 years ago or so, um, uh, some ABC reporters got some information um, about what were allegations of tampering with food by employees of Food Line, which is a supermarket chain, I think mostly in the South. Um, the allegations included that when ground beef in the stores, uh, it, uh, past its expiration date that the employees would grind it with fresh beef and then relabel it. Um, that they, really the nastiest of these is that when there was meat that started to smell, they would bleach it uh, to remove the smell and put it back. Yeah, it's pretty gross. Um, that they would redate out of date meat. Um, you know, I mean, it was stuff that had obvious potential uh, public hazard to it. Um, and so they set out to try to check these allegations. Good tip, important story, they're doing the right thing. They're trying to figure out if it's true. Um, to do that, they decided to engage in an undercover uh, technique. Um, and so what they did is they had two reporters from ABC who applied for jobs with Food Line in different uh, parts of the South, one in North Carolina, one in South Carolina. They used false names on their applications. Um, they faked their educational backgrounds. Um, uh, and they faked their employment histories. Needless to say, neither of them listed ABC uh, as their employer. Um, to make a long story a little shorter, um, eventually they both got hired. Uh, one in April of 92 in, which one? In South Carolina as a deli clerk, and one the following month in North Carolina as a meat wrapper trainee. Um, God forbid you should ever end up as a meat wrapper trainee. But, um, <clears throat> but uh, the one worked for two weeks. Uh, I'm not actually sure which one worked for two weeks and which worked for one, but they worked for a, combination, for a combined three weeks for Food Lion. Um, while they were working for Food Lion, each of them was carrying um, a hidden camera. Um, they recorded over the, again, between the two of them, they recorded about 45 hours of video uh, in the three weeks that they were for Food Lion, and then both quit. Um, now, let me read to you, this eventually results in a lawsuit, as you, as you uh, already, I'm sure, know. Uh, let me read to you from one of the court opinions, that, just because it nicely describes what was alleged in this case. Um, some of the videotape, the, some of this 45 hours of videotape, was eventually used in a November 5, 1992 broadcast of Primetime Live. ABC contends that the footage confirmed many of the allegations initially leveled against Food Lion, in other words, the tip that they initially got. 
The broadcast included, for example, videotape that appeared to show Food Lion employees repackaging and uh, redating fish that had passed the expiration date, grinding expired beef with fresh beef, and applying barbecue sauce to chicken past its expiration date in order to mask the smell and sell it as fresh in the gourmet food section. That, by the way, is my favorite detail of all this, is that they took the bad chicken, put barbecue sauce, and then charged more for it. Um, <clears throat> um, Continuing, um, the program included statements by former Food Lion employees alleging even more serious mishandling of meat as at Food Lion stores across several states. The truth of the primetime live broadcast was not an issue in the litigation we now describe. Okay, so that's important fact right there. Food Lion is not denying that these things occurred. Um, now, there, there's a lot of debate uh, at the time and since about how widespread uh, these issues were, but what, they don't deny that what you see on the camera in fact occurred. Um, instead, Food Lion sued, so uh, if, you know, in a kind of traditional journalism context, if there were an allegation that this were false, Food Lion or the employees who were captured in the tapes might have sued for, for libel or slander or any of the various things that go along with false uh, reporting. Um, instead, what Food Lion did is it, it sued for fraud. It argued that these two reporters had committed fraud in their applications. Trespass, which is interesting because it says that they didn't, they, they, didn't have the legal right to be on the property because they got there by fraud. Something called breach of duty of loyalty, which is rarely used um, in a case like this, but it assumes that an employee of a company has a duty of loyalty to the company and that these employees during the brief time they worked there violated it. And then they also alleged violation of business practice laws. Um, this is a, this for legal reasons uh, is a really complicated case, partly because it arises out of two states that have different laws. Food line is in both states, so the different business practices may apply in different states. Uh, forget all of that, but just understand that it was a complicated case to try. Um, eventually, uh, after this uh, uh, complicated trial, um, Food Lion, um, uh, is the, the reporters rather, are found guilty of various counts in this by the jury in this case. Um, it rejected an important Food Lion claim. Food Lion's stock went to, in the tank after this thing appeared, as again, for reasons you might expect. Um, and Food Lion alleged that ABC was liable for its stock losses. Um, the, they did not prevail on that count. Um, they did prevail on a number of other claims. They, they, the reporters were found guilty to have committed fraud. Um, and Food Lion was awarded $1,400 uh, on that count. They were given a dollar uh, for each count of trespass. The reporters were found guilty to have trespassed, but there were, the jury found no substantial harm to Food Lion in that case. So they got a dollar each for the two counts of trespass. And they got, um, uh, and, and that was merged together with the duty of loyalty claim, so there's a $2 verdict there. And then there's a $1,500 uh, verdict for violation of the state business codes. Um, it, what the, what the court did not find, the court found that while there was a loss in stock value, that, be, that you couldn't find that the stock values price, that the stock was depreciated because of the fraud. In other words, yes, I committed fraud by lying on the application, but that isn't what caused the stock to drop. What caused the stock to drop is the, is the image of the, you know, person grinding the meat or whatever. So that the guiltiness on the fraud count didn't lead to the stock, so the stock issue was not resolved, was, was set aside in the case. The jury, however, which took real umbrage uh, at this case. People who have uh, talked to the jury later found that the jurors were really offended by the notion that these reporters would come in and, and you know, try to do this on their own, act as effectively law enforcement. And they took it out on ABC in a big way, which is that they were uh, awarded over five and a half million dollars in punitive damages. So they, all these trivial sort of chicken shit, you know, $1,400 there, $2 here, is one thing. But then there was an actual big judgment uh, against ABC. Um, the judge found that that judgment was just wildly excessive and lowered it to $315,000. So both sides appealed. ABC appealing the judgments, um, the, you know, the, the findings of guilt, and uh, Food Lion uh, appealing the reduction uh, in the amount. Um, so the Fourth Circuit, which then ultimately heard this case, and I read from the Fourth Circuit opinion just a minute ago uh, summarizing the, uh, the facts of it, the Fourth Circuit rejected most of the claims. It rejected uh, the fraud claim. It rejected the, the, notion, the business code violations. Um, but it upheld the trespass. It found that the reporters had, in fact, trespassed on Food Lion's property. Um, what's most important in all of this, though, and I realize this is a long wind-up to it, but um, 
is that it did not find that the First Amendment protected what these reporters engaged in. And again, I'll read to you from the opinion. It says, the Supreme Court has said in no uncertain terms that generally applicable laws do not offend the First Amendment simply because their enforcement against the press has incidental effects on its ability to gather and report the news. Um, okay, so what they're saying here is that as long as a law is not passed to restrict the press, if it has the effect of restricting reporters incidentally, you know, on the margins, in the same way that it restricts the rest of us. So if it, if it inhibits my ability to get an interview because there's a jaywalking law, that doesn't mean that I can jaywalk where someone else can't just because I'm a reporter, is in essence what they're saying. And just to, later in the same opinion, they, they note, we are convinced that the media can do its important job effectively without resort to the commission of run-of-the-mill torts. So the, this court is convinced that reporters are not really inhibited by these rules. Um, so in the end, this is a, in one sense, ABC wins a great victory. Because by tossing out all these other claims and leaving the trespass claims, the whole judgment against ABC goes from what started at an excess of five and a half million to two dollars. So that's the, what they're on the hook for, is two bucks. Now, I guarantee you they spent millions of dollars defending it, though. So this wasn't a pleasant experience uh, for ABC. Um, but more importantly, in terms of establishing the kind of legal parameters here, this court, even in ruling on behalf of ABC on almost all the, the important counts here, it does not defend the reporter's rights to lie um, or to deceive in order to get these jobs. Um, so you know, I guess the question then for this is, and for all of you, is ethically, did ABC do something wrong? Did its reporters do something wrong? Is it uh, an acceptable practice, journalistically, to lie in order to get access to a, a facility? If, if your objective, and if, if, as was the case here, what you are to present to the public is of important <coughs> public consequence. What do people think? the chapter, so the way I see it is like if they, they, there's other ways that they could have gone about doing this where they wouldn't have had to lie, they could have just tested the meat. Uh -huh. So in some cases there are times when I do believe that going undercover to do reporting is acceptable because there's no other way to possibly get the story and if it is potentially harmful to, you know, people then they should do it. But in this case... There was other options. Well, so you put your finger on two criteria by which to start to evaluate this, which is alternative sources or alternative methods um, and uh, public import. Uh, you wouldn't want to do undercover reporting for something trivial, and you wouldn't want to do it if you could do the same work some other way. Um, I think those are two good starting points. Yeah. Um, I know also in the chapter, like the critique of that was that probably a lot of supermarkets are participating in the same sort of practices. And they only pointed out food line, which like kind of makes it seem like, oh, you should just shop at the other places because they're a lot better. Mm -hmm. when really they're you don't know. Exactly. Right. In fact, not only do you not know that, we don't really know. I mean, one defect of any kind of anecdotal reporting, which is to say reporting in which you extrapolate some large message from some small amount of information, is we don't really even know what, how widespread within food line this might have been, right? I mean, we have the, it, the report that ultimately appeared is not just the undercover camera stuff. It's supplemented by other interviews and people saying that this goes on all over. But the camera itself can't tell you whether something is widespread or just limited to that day you happen to capture it. Um, who else? Yes. I feel that undercover reporters are almost like undercover police. If undercover police, um, you know, they're trying to do their job, they would have to be able to get the case. And it's, it's, uh, the, the comparison to police is a good one and an important one to think about. What I would say there, though, is that before police can engage in this kind of work, a judge has to give them permission to do it. Um, so if you're going if, if to, well, it would depend on the circumstance, and so I shouldn't be too general. But in general, I would say the, um, if, if police are to try to secure evidence, uh, it, you know, by wiretapping, by installation of hidden cameras, et cetera, they're going to need a warrant to do it. So this is, police are supposed to be supervised by a judge in a way that these reporters were not supervised by a judge. So there is a, a bit more of a freewheeling quality. This Police have rights that reporters don't. 
Yeah. Yeah, I definitely think that um, a bigger ethical problem with reporters going undercover is how they're handling, like, for example, the people working at Frontline. Mm -hmm. Because it could be embarrassing for them to be on this tape, mm -hmm. or even if they are named in interviews and things like that. So I think that's where like some sort of approval would need to be. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that there's anything wrong with reporters if it only like solely affects them or just getting information um, to go in and try and crack something that wouldn't be discovered otherwise. Mm -hmm. What if a reporter, this goes to your question of sort of the, the individual people who might get captured on camera. If these Food Lion reporters had gone in there, I mean, sorry, ABC reporters uh, had gone into Food Lion looking for evidence of, of mishandling meat and et cetera, the kinds of things they did go, and instead found that that wasn't going on, but that there were three employees in the North Carolina store, you know, dealing cocaine, and they caught that on camera. Um, suddenly the equations would change, right? The, the public's interest in that might really diminish, because presumably that doesn't affect food quality. Um, and, yet, and the privacy interests of the employees might really be heightened. Um, so one of the things that I think is, um, that you've, you've identified, one of the things that's difficult here is there's, the target of the reporting is in one sense the company, but in another sense it's the individual employees. And the company's interests and the employee's interests might not be identical throughout this, and they might change, because you, you don't really know what you're going to find until you go find it. Anyone else on this? Um, well, let me uh, follow this up then, and, and, and if you do have additional thoughts on that, save them for a minute, because uh, there's another example I wanted to call your attention that has many of the same aspects of Food Lion, uh, but is much older um, and is kind of a different place in our history. And, and that's the reporting um, of Upton Sinclair uh, in the early 1900s. Um, now, some of you will have read uh, Sinclair or know of him anyway. Sinclair's best known work is The Jungle. Um, uh, the Jungle, uh, Upton Sinclair was a socialist writer uh, in the early part of the 20th century, one of the muckraking journalists I referred to earlier. Um, and in 1905, he, he traveled to Chicago under contract uh, from a social, by a socialist newspaper uh, to write an inside story of meatpacking. So as I say, in some ways quite parallel to what we're talking about with Food Lion, meatpacking, not grocery handling, but, but still handling of food. Um, he, uh, he went to work for the, in the yards there in Chicago um, and uh, produced a novel, The Jungle, which is, as I say, his best known work. Now, it's a novel. It's not a nonfiction work. Um, but in the course of writing, uh, developing the novel, he also wrote a series of serialized accounts for various socialist publications and also Collier's Magazine and others, um, describing uh, the terrible conditions uh, in these yards. Now, interestingly, this is another uh, good example of uh, sort of what you were identifying, which is going in with one idea and heading off into another place. Uh, Sinclair's great quote about his book is, he says, I aimed at the public's heart and by accident I hit it in the stomach. Um, which is to say he wanted the public to sympathize with the terrible conditions of workers uh, that workers had in these stockyards. Instead, what the public reacted to, frankly, was not much uh, in sympathy for the workers, but in a revulsion at the, the sort of grotesque conditions he described with respect to food uh, that was going through there. Um, Teddy Roosevelt was president at the time, was quite impressed uh, by the series and the reaction to him, although he was quite unimpressed with the socialist uh, coda and all of it. But in, in any case, he was impressed by the findings. Um, and he asked two uh, officials who he trusted in the federal government to go and conduct their own study because he was frankly sort of distrustful of Sinclair because of his politics. Uh, they. Um, even though the stockyards uh, and the meatpacking places were tipped off to the fact that these guys were going to be conducting an inspection and worked for weeks to try to clean up the yards, the, the two officials were still appalled uh, by what they found there. Um, and the, the result ultimately was, uh, I think it was in 1906 or 1907, uh, the federal government passed the Meat Inspection Act um, and the Pure Food and Drug Act, uh, yeah, 1906, which later became the foundation for what we now know as the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. Um, so we have an entire national system, uh, flawed though it is in some ways, of food and drug inspection um, that really grows out of an act of undercover reporting. Um, an, an act of undercover reporting that is not so different from what, these food, uh, from what the ABC reporters did in Food Lion. They heard about appalling conditions. They recognized that there was a um, potential threat to the public. They lied about who they were in order to get inside and see, and then they reported back out. 
So Upton Sinclair does it, and we regard him as a hero of 20th century journalism. Two ABC employees do it, and they go through a drawn out, grueling legal episode uh, that results in a kind of half-hearted victory uh, for both sides. So what's the difference? You know, <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> Although that's a, uh, it's a good point, and um, I'm trying to think if any of these examples do involve that kind of government cooperation. In fact, there is one we're going to talk about in a minute that ha does involve some government cooperation. Um, one potential downside of that is that sometimes the target of the reporting, one of the targets might include the federal government. I mean, one of the issues, I don't know the case in Food Lion, but, but it's often the case, in fact, that one of the, we'll look at a videotape, uh, we'll talk about a videotape on Thursday about a, an undercover TV uh, investigation of the, the food market in downtown Los Angeles. And there, one of the allegations of the reporting was that the inspectors were not doing an adequate job. So if you go and you tell the inspectors and ask for their help, then you've kind of taken that off the table. Um, but you're absolutely right. It is a key difference um, historically that, that when Sinclair is doing his work, the federal government took no responsibility for this at all, whereas today, at least, it's supposed to. Um, any other differences or thoughts on either of these cases? Yes, please. I, think it's, I can see the comparisons, but I think it's hard to compare um, these two cases just because the meatpacking industry in the early 1900s was so vastly like disgusting. I guess you could say. <laughs> right. Um, with regards to their process in I Bread the Jungle, it's mm -hmm. horrible. It's horrible, yeah. <clears throat> With the food line case, like, yes, none of us want to eat that meat. It probably isn't sanitary and everything. But I think that the exposure level and the need for exposure is so much greater with Upton Sinclair. And yet you don't really know that till you get in and look around, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I think you're right that on a sort of scale of magnitude, you know, a couple of grocery workers in South Carolina putting barbecue sauce on chicken is different than uh, than the whole meat industry centered in Chicago being corrupted or, or um, unsanitary. Um, but you know, until you go in, and st Upton Sinclair didn't know until he went inside whether he would find a few incidents of uh, bad behavior or whether he would find something widespread. And likewise, neither of these ABC employees. Yes? I think it's just, it's a greater issue nowadays, the whole privacy thing and you know, the whole intrusion of either government or the press into your life. I mean, I mean, obviously, we've had First Amendment freedoms and all that since you know, the beginning of this country, but like, I don't think people were as concerned during the Upton Sinclair era about, oh, well, you know, my right to privacy and things like that. No, mm -hmm. it's just really uptight about that stuff now. So even if, you know, someone's potentially uncovering a health crisis or something, you know, with technology and mass media the way it is, people, I think, are even more scared of having their Right. I mean, one of the things that comes up often, and again, I think I'll talk about a little bit more on Thursday in this uh, food market case, um, or example, rather, it's not really a case in the same way that some of these are, but um, is where, and I've used this phrase before, but where do you enjoy a reasonable expectation of privacy? Um, if the allegation was that, you know, that I had an unsanitary kitchen in my home and Primetime Live came snooping around uh, and ran, a, you know, then I, clearly I think I'd have every right to feel violated. Um, but if the argument is that at the mall that there's garbage stacked up out back, it may be a piece of private property, but there may be so many people and there may be such a kind of public um, access to it that we may think of it somewhat differently than a private <coughs> home. Um, you know, a, you could imagine a university has some of the same complications, that this is um, well, this is a public university, so that complicates it still further. But there are places within you know, a professor's office where he or she might feel an expectation of privacy, and yet we're on a public piece of property. And, um, and you got, it, it's a difficult analysis to ask where people f actually genuinely enjoy the right to be private. Um, in this case, uh, you know, a workplace is different than a home. So I would say that 
that people who come to work at Food Lion give up some measure of privacy. They're among other people. They can be seen by the public, you know, I mean, et cetera. But if you, had a, if you were an executive at Food Lion and you had an office, you might have a higher degree of privacy there than if you were working behind the meat counter. So those, these things become complicated, even in a society that is also, by the way, somewhat schizophrenic, I would say, about privacy, in the sense that we are, on one hand, a place where we really do want places we can retreat to, and on the other hand, people are revealing private information about themselves to the world in a way that people would never would have dreamed of uh, in, in Sinclair's day. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I think there's a primary difference between the medium that, as well, though, is that this was projected in mm. because, you know, in 1992, being on television is a lot bigger, you know, more of a privacy issue than being in a book. Uh -huh. I think that's right. Well, and the fact that the book, of course, is a novel. Um, so within the novel, names are changed. And, and I suspect um, there's a very famous scene at the opening of the novel of a wedding uh, that he did. In fact, it gave him his real launch on the book. Um, uh, I suspect that the people who actually were in the wedding that he attended probably did recognize themselves in it, even though their names were changed. There's nothing about the wedding that would cause them to be offended, I don't think, about the portrayal. but. I suspect, in other words, my point is, I guess, that even within the novel, even with changed names, there probably are people who could recognize themselves. Um, and in the, in the reporting itself, as you point out, uh, the effect of being reported on in this probably felt very different than it did for the Food Lion employees. Um, the other thing is that he was writing in defense of the employees and against the corporation, whereas in the Food Lion case, the employees themselves might have more reason to feel violated. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I have oh, I'm sorry, yeah. I think that's one of the open questions about the report is, did it uncover something that was pervasive throughout Food Lion? Did it uncover something that was pervasive throughout the grocery industry? That's to your point earlier. Um, or did it just happen to tag a couple of, of you know, uh, misbehaving employees? Um, I'm, I think it's safe to say that Food Lion has one view of that and ABC has another view of that. Uh, but it's hard to know for sure. And I think that that is perennially a problem with this kind of reporting in that it's very tempting to think that what you've seen yourself must be going on everywhere and that you've only seen a little bit of it. But you, it's hard to know that for sure. It's only other reporting can give you that information. Um, let me come back to you in just a second. Yeah. Um, just isn't the fact that they have two separate reporters at two separate locations with the same thing going on? indicate that it's more widespread than... I'm sure that's why they did it that way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because they, because you're right. That helps. The more you see, the more you can start to generalize. Um, I, I don't know how many Food Lion stores there are, uh, but I'm, I suspect that seeing two of them, that in Food Lion's view, that seeing two stores doesn't give you a, an adequate picture of the whole chain. There are ways um, to bolster, and good undercover reporting is almost always bolstered by other kinds of reporting. Um, again, I'll, I'll, we'll talk about it on Thursday, but this, uh, this food uh, market case, it's for out of here in LA, you'll see when you, if you haven't seen the tape yet, it's, it's one of the clips uh, in the syllabus, um, and I was just watching it over the weekend. They do a good job of supplementing the undercover camera work with health reports uh, and interviews with others, and so it, it helps give you a sense that it's not just the, you know, the, the 30 seconds of film that you see. Yes? How close in proximity were the two? Well, they're in two different states. One's in North Carolina, one's in South Carolina. I, I can't tell you for sure whether they were just on opposite sides of the border or whatnot. But yeah, I think the unquestionably the reason to choose two instead of one is to be able to begin to speak more broadly. And and as I say, their reporting was also bolstered by interviews with former Food Lion employees who said this kind of thing happened a lot. So it wasn't just um, an isolated snapshot. In in that way, oddly, it may be more. Um, probing than Sinclair's work, because Sinclair really wasn't going out and interviewing executives of the, of the meatpacking industry to ask for their response to his findings. He had no interest in that. He was trying to write a, a vivid story of life in the, in the stockyards and in the meatpacking industry. So in that sense, theirs is, is probably more probative and more comprehensive than his. Yes? <clears throat> I think that also makes the Food Lion case especially telling, is that they were only there for it's a really good point. <clears throat> Just because if these things are happening, like if they get there and they're immediately happening, that tells me that they're happening. <laughs> right. Oh, that's funny. I thought you were going to go the other direction with that, but that's a good point too. Um, is that it's for all the reasons that seeing a snapshot that's that's narrow, um, you know, sort of geographically, seeing something that's narrow in time 
is potentially distorting or potentially especially illuminating. As you say, if, if, the first, if the first thing you learn on the job is how to taint meat, then that probably tells you something about it. Uh, on the other hand, you might have just happened upon the week where the one employee who's doing this all the time happened to be working, and if you'd come the next week, you might not have seen anything at all. So it, you just don't know what you don't know. Um, yeah. <clears throat> um, I wonder if the story was reported at, in, a, in a newspaper, uh -huh. on ABC, as a television with a different sort of thing. Um, and also, um, if they had made their case centered around uh, gathering ev evidence another way, and that would have I think, and I think they did do some of that, right? I mean, one of the things that's interesting about undercover reporting um, over the last sort of fifteen or twenty years is that it's very much on the decline in newspapers, and it's very much on the increase in TV. Um, and uh, you know, as I said earlier in this class, in general the medium shouldn't dictate the ethics of a practice. The, these, these, pra these ethics ought to be sufficiently uh, strong to withstand the, the pressures of various media. I mean, you have no less obligation to be accurate and fair and to be careful in the use of anonymous sources if you're blogging or writing a TV script or writing for a newspaper. Um, I think, though, the reality is that the ABC undoubtedly could have produced a very strong um, look at taint by, at, by food line employees at these same stores or system-wide, and it wouldn't have made very good television without images. And so there are uh, entertainment imperatives that attach to television that are kind of unattractive. Um, and, you know, that's, uh, and I suspect that's why we've seen an increase in, on the TV side, is that you know, if you read a newspaper account into a camera, it's not very riveting television. Um, but if you get to see, and again, this, uh, this clip that you'll see later in the week, you know, there's this picture of this, this poor sad sack employee uh, urinating next to a box of food, uh, fruit at the farmer's, or at the, the food market. You know, and then they catch him and he sort of, you know, says, oh, I'm an idiot, I'm sorry. Uh, I, mean, I mean, he's just this sort of, you know, dopey um, guy who gets caught. Well, that's a lot better television than a description that says occasionally employees urinated near the day. You know, I mean, one has a humanity to it, even if it's a sort of hard to watch humanity, uh, where the other is kept dry. And, and I suspect that's, while we shouldn't regard the ethics of these practices differently, that's why it's increasing in one sphere and decreasing in the other. Um, and I, I don't suspect that anyone could honestly disagree with that. Um, who else, anyone? Yes, please. Oh, sorry. I like the argument that well, is an isolated incident or not or whatever? Can't you just easily solve that by saying on camera, oh, by the way, this is the only place we filmed this? Mm -hmm. like, so yeah. Yeah, although uh, in this case, the way they tried to, they, they did it a somewhat different way, which is to say, this is the only place we filmed it. But we talked to these other employees who used to work at Food Lion and say they saw this instance and they saw it over here and it's not just confined to these two stores. And that's quite responsible, I think. You know, I mean, because if you really... Um, setting aside the kind of entertainment uh, pressures uh, in all of this, if you really have discovered something that is widespread and illustrated it with a couple of riveting examples, that's good work. The only question is, if, if you had to lie to get it, does that somehow undermine um, either the specific finding or the report generally? Um, and I will tell you this, that in the wake of um, Food Lion, there is a lot less deception going on um, in, in certain kinds, in certain places in journalism because people are afraid. Uh, I mean, this, as I say, they ended up with a $2 uh, judgment against them. That's no big deal. But if you have to spend 3 or $4 million to get your $2 uh, judgment, then this, it's not easy, not to mention the, the time and the difficulties that were entailed in all of this. Litigation is expensive and exhausting and hard. And if you have to fight all the way to the Fourth Circuit to, to get this thing reduced to something manageable, as an institution, you're going to be less likely to do it again. <clears throat> yes? It's kind of hard for me to see the problem in it because, like, they're doing something bad in the first place, Food Lion is. Like, if they were innocent, then it would be bad, obviously, but I feel like they're reporting something that is, like, the other, basically, Food Lion is committing a crime. I mean, well, Food Lion might not be. Food Lion, ex you know, Food Lion is not really a doesn't really have the potential to be a criminal, right? It's, a, it's yeah. an entity. Um, you know, what if Food Lion's response is, we fire people when we hear about this? 
we don't sanction this practice. We don't want people doing this. They did it on their own because they're lazy or they're, you know, or they don't care about the customer. Now that we know about it, they're fired. Then is Food Lion, I mean, I'm not arguing that that's the case here, but if it were, in the same way, this comes up in police cases all the time. So that, you know, there's a videotape of police officers, you know, beating someone senseless with their batons or kicking them or whatever. The police department's response generally is, we, we tell them not to do that, and we fire them when we catch them doing that. That doesn't mean that they don't do it, but we as an agency are not responsible. They as individuals are responsible. And this goes, goes to your earlier point on the, you know, you might capture individual misconduct that's different than corporate malfeasance. <clears throat> but I feel like the, the reporter should just report that. That's their statement on it. Mm -hmm. And then let the public decide which way it wants to mm -hmm. go with it. Because, I mean, that's very important to the public to know that their food is possibly expired. And I think the decline in the stock price of Food Lion shows yeah. what the, how the public responded to just that. Yes? Um, to solve that problem, like the, the security camera, like in the side, like where they were working, and, I mean, they do that in, like, restaurants and stores and mm -hmm. things like that. So I don't see why there would be an ethical concern with putting a security camera in there. And then that would have, for food line's sake, they, they couldn't be backed up. You know, if the security camera, for example, proved them otherwise. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, you know, one, I had never even thought of it, but I suppose one really interesting way to go about a piece of reporting like this would be to, to go and make the allegations to the owner of a store and, and sort of collaborate with them on seeing if they could capture this. I don't know how that would change the, the reporting, but you're right. It, it certainly points out the fact that um, if Food Lion knew of these allegations, there are things it could have done to discourage the practice that, that might have changed things. Yeah. And that has to do with the area of undercover reporting, but with a kind of official permission. Um, so this, to, in the Food Lion case, it might have been to ask the question whether they could have gone in with the collaboration of corporate officials. In this case, um, it involves some reporting on prisons um, from the early 70s. Um, the Washington Post was doing a, a series of um, uh, analyses of prisons. Um, I, f I think it's called, it was called the State of Our Prisons or the State of the Nation's Prisons or something. Anyway, it's an eight-part series, quite, uh, quite uh, well regarded. Um, in the course of reporting on it, Ben Bagdikian, who was one of the reporters, one of the two main reporters on it, uh, concluded that he really needed to go inside a prison um, in order to get a sense of what it was like. Um, and uh, he found a remarkably cooperative state attorney general who arranged for him to be incarcerated under a false name and with a false charge um, so that the, uh, the warden and the guards and the inmates in the prison did not know that he was a reporter. Um, but he went in there with the permission of the, of the Attorney General's office, and with, frankly, with the, you know, the collaboration of the Attorney General. They manufactured um, a, a reason to incarcerate him. Um, so he goes out, he reports, I actually don't know how long he spent in prison, but he spends some time in prison, he comes back out. And here, it's, to my mind anyway, to sort of one of the, a point that a number of you have raised, which is, you know, do you, how much can you learn by the undercover portion of it, and can you just report that out in isolation? The Post did a superb job of packaging it as part of a larger series. So it didn't try to pretend that what Bagdikian saw was indicative of the whole prison system. It was one of eight parts uh, in the series. Um, and it was offered up as a snapshot uh, of what prison life can be like and is like. Uh, I think it was a Pennsylvania prison. Um, so in, um, you know, there, are, there is still harm uh, or potential harm from this kind of reporting. There is still the possibility of invading the privacy of guards or inmates. Um, the, needless to say, a prison inmate gives up a certain measure of privacy. So this is if, in our continuum of privacy. If, if, you know, if your, your kitchen or your bedroom is sort of at one end of the continuum, prisons are pretty well over here on the other side of it. Um, nevertheless, uh, these are people who don't know that they're being watched by a journalist, and they were. Um, that applies to, to the warden and to guards as well, obviously. Um, and there's the potential for distortion, although, as I say, I think the Post did a good job of handling that issue by packaging it as part of the larger series. Um, on the other side, uh, obviously, it gave uh, a, a really uh, poignant and, and vivid account of the prisons that a that looking at reports or doing uh, you know more sort of you know uh, distant kind of reporting wouldn't uh, give. It gives a kind of detail and a sense of poignancy of what it's really like to be inside um, that is difficult to get otherwise. Um, so uh, again, we reach questions of balance. So I guess what's different about this example than most examples of undercover reporting is that it had a kind of official sanction. It didn't have the sanction of 
people who were being looked at. Of course, if it had had that sanction, then there's kind of no point in doing it at all, right? I mean, because if you say to the warden, we're going to spend the next two weeks with this guy analyzing how effective you are, um, presumably he'll be very effective uh, over those two weeks. Um, um, but, but it had the sanction of someone involved in the system. It did, he didn't go in and, and you know, lie to all officials. He got a, a top official to clear his way to do it. So does that change the equation at all? Yeah. Um, what exactly were they trying to report, like the maltreatment? <laughs> yeah, well, a lot of the, the series overall is to look at the difficult, bad conditions in American prisons. Um, and it looks at it from all kinds of angles. But this particular piece was to look at the question of, of, of sort of to present to the public what it's like to be in prison. That you know the the re regimen of prison, the the danger of prison, the uh, um, the crowdedness. That you know I mean, to give a real sense of what it is like. And and as I say, it, it's hard to imagine that you could get that if you went to the warden and said. I want to report on how difficult it is to be in this prison. Well, presumably you're going to get a different kind of treatment than if the warden doesn't know. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's important too that if his identity had been known, he would probably be in danger in prison. Also true. And, like you said, the warden would have probably treated him differently. So yeah, the warden might have treated him better, and other people might have treated him worse. Yeah. Uh, so I think in this case, like I agree with the undercover reporting, mm -hmm. especially since it's been sanctioned. Mm -hmm. What if um, they had, I don't know how you would do this, but what if the Post had figured out a way to fabricate a conviction for him so that the Attorney General and others in the system weren't aware of it? Um, now, there would, have been, there would have been the question at the end of how to get him back out again. Um, but, but, I mean, imagine for a moment that somehow they'd figured out that problem, and I, I don't know how they would do it. But um, does that change it at all? Does, does, does the, in other words, does the absence of that kind of official sanction change the ethics of the decision to send him inside? I think with this case, it'd be really hard to do that. I think so, too. Yeah. Um, I mean, practically, that may, be, that, that may be the answer. But, but in a way, I think that having the official verification or, I guess, authority uh, to do it strengthens their case mm -hmm. because it's obviously something that the attorney general wanted mm -hmm. uh, information on as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, a version of this arises in a modern context in, uh, in covering wars, uh, where you know, there's this notion of the embed, uh, the embedded journalist. And those are journalists who are specifically sanctioned. Now, in this case, they're all known to be journalists, so that people who are fighting know that that person over there is not just one of them. That's another, they're there for a different reason. Uh, but it has an official sanction. You're, you know, you're given special permission to be with them. Whereas you could imagine, um, you know, a news organization hiring a soldier and having that soldier secretly report on the work of the unit so that they wouldn't have the same kind of official sanction. It might be distracting, but um, it embeds, creates some of the same issues as the uh, of official sanction uh, for that kind of reporting. Yeah, James, did you have one? Yeah, I think this is like a completely different case because a food line case, they were going in to, re to uncover um, that work practices. This, I doubt if they would get the same cooperation from the attorney general if they're going in to uncover guards uh, raping prisoners or something like that. It's a good point, something right. That would Presumably the government's selective in its authorization. Right. <clears throat> so I think, you know, if they could fabricate a way to get in, it's, 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 I think it's exactly the same. Like, ethically, it's like it doesn't really matter, mm -hmm. even though they couldn't do it. I mean, it is also true that once inside, the attorney general has lost the ability to really to control the situation. If, some, if a guard does do something horrible in that time, well, you know, I guess the attorney general's answer might be, well, we want to get rid of bad guards, too. Mm -hmm. But you're right. It, it, once that person's in there, there's very little they can do, the government can do, to then kind of recalibrate the situation. Mm -hmm. Also, I think with the food line situation, you're dealing with people's, um, you know, their well-being, their employment, their, their business and stocks and things like that. So. I think there's more of an ethical issue there than with the hmm. prison system because, I mean, honestly, yeah, you have to factor in that a there could be, um, there could be issues in trying to get an official to okay it because what if they want to cover their own ass because they've been negligent in you know regulating, you know, the prison system or what mm -hmm. have you. But I mean, there aren't consumers that are being affected. There aren't employees that are, you know, it's right. I, I, I mean, I agree with you up to a point in the sense that it's not 
the same kind of consumer. But in, uh, in another way, there really are heightened interests in prison, right? Because the, the government doesn't have a constitutional obligation to see that your chicken that has barbecue sauce on it isn't past its expiration date. The government has a constitutional obligation to keep people safe in prison. So if people are in danger in prison, you're right that the general public may not be affected, but the small population that is affected might be profoundly affected by it. Um, and so in that sense, the, the, the danger issues are different. They're more confined in number, but more attenuated in, uh, in potential impact. You know, people could die. I mean, I suppose you could die by eating the barbecue chicken, too. But, but for the most part, the danger in prison is probably higher than the danger of mixing your ground beef. Uh, it's just gross. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I think, I think a key distinction in this case is that they receive that official sanction to, uh, <coughs> to pursue um, particularly um, what the conditions were prisoners um, in this particular case. And that makes it better ethically, uh, more defensible, less defensible? I think it, it sort of combines um, how far you can go. I think you can report on what the conditions are, but you can't then go and um, start invading other people's privacy just because you have the right to go into this prison. What if you're there with that official sanction, as they had, and, uh, and you're in your cell one evening, and a prisoner across the aisle, I don't know what this prison looked like, but um, kills another one, and you watch him do it. Um, uh, presumably, the attorney general didn't, would not have preferred uh, that you see that, but you're there, and you see it. Do you feel any constraints on what you're uh, entitled to report? I think you might, depending on, um, well, it could be that the, the situation for the prison so much stress that prisoners are turning and that definitely would It's a good story. I mean, it's an important story. Yeah, I don't know in that case. I think possibly if that compromises your investigation, you may not want to report it until later. You would be, let me just point out that if you don't report that fact, you're in a really tough fix because if you report it, then paper can publish it, and when there's a trial, you can stand by it. If you don't report it, you're a witness. You're not a reporter anymore. You're someone who's in the cell across the way. And you can be sure that when the alleged murderer is charged, he's going to want testimony that says he didn't do it or that there were extenuating circumstances. And suddenly, you've, you're going to tran be transformed from a journalistic figure to a witness in a murder trial. And it's going to be, that's going to be complicated in its own way. Uh, so one thing that's always problematic about this kind of stuff is if you see bad things happen, uh, you've got to handle them journalistically in a way that doesn't immerse yourself in the criminal case. Uh, maybe one more, and then I'll go on to this last example. Yeah, please. Um, I was thinking about how you said presumably the DA wouldn't want you to report that. I think you need to go into it telling the DA, like, if you give me permission, I'm going to report everything that I see. Like, I, I'm not going to make special right. exceptions for things that you don't I think you, you have to have free reign. Um, otherwise, otherwise, you really are an agent of the government. At that point, you're just being hired by the government to do it. I think that's smart, yeah. All right, well, let me do my last example here, which is my favorite of these. Um, not because it's the most defensible, but because it's the most fun. Um, in, uh, in May of 1977, um, two, two reporters from the Chicago Sun-Times, with the permission of their editor, um, bought a tavern uh, in Chicago. Rundown tavern again. This one, some of this is in your reading. Um, they they set out to fix it up, but when I say fix it up, I don't mean that they meant to actually make it better. They meant to bribe the right number of officials in order to get approval to open it. Um, so they bribed, you know, electrical inspectors and plumbing inspectors and ventilation inspectors. It's just a great. I mean, it's just as fun as you can imagine. Um, the accountants uh, showed them how to cheat on their taxes. The guys who sold the pinball machines showed them how to skim money off the pinball take. It's just a just rampant corruption. Um, uh, so they opened this bar in August, a couple months later, after they have uh, bribed all these officials. And then they, believe it or not, they ran it uh, for six months, or not quite six months. They ran it until November, I guess it was. Um, the whole time, all these inspectors are coming in. They had photographers up in a loft pretending to be workmen, so they're taking pictures of these guys taking bribes. People like would sign off on it for ten dollars. I mean, it's it's the it's incredibly widespread and incredibly cheap uh, to to you know, sort of buy your way uh, into a tavern in Chicago in those days. Um, and then be, because it's you know written in this kind of splashy tabloid way, they do a twenty-five part series on it. Um, and you can just feel how much fun uh, they had doing this project if, if you read these pieces. Um, my favorite description in them is at one point they describe that um, uh, the, the bar is having 
Uh, more code violations than bar stools. Um, it's really fun. Uh, in any case, um, it's a you know it's a whole kind of different level uh, in undercover reporting because we're now no longer talking about sneaking people into some other place. We're talking about creating a place that is in itself the undercover location. Um, there may be other examples of this, but this this is certainly the the most uh, the best known and the one I'm most familiar with anyway. Um, the, and there is later, we'll talk about this one again on Thursday, but um, there's a now a new iteration of this idea um, in a TV uh, incarnation, which is this series that some of you may have heard of called To Catch a Predator, um, which is this, you know, again, we'll talk about it more on Thursday, but it uses sort of the same idea, which is really, we're really talking about creating a trap uh, here. Um, um, and creating a place uh, in which to lure uh, people. So, all right, again, let's sort of just to do the same exercise that we've done with these other cases, look at the harm and the benefit uh, of this. Um, on the downside, there's certainly a risk that the paper looks just vengeful, um, that, uh, that the paper is in effect turning itself into an agent of law enforcement. This is a sting operation. Um, there is no judge to issue a warrant. There is no law enforcement oversight. Um, and yet these people are going to be, if not arrested by the newspaper, they're certainly going to be held up to public ridicule and undoubtedly uh, to, to face consequences. Um, it's also unlike um, the Food Lion or the Washington Post case, uh, or you know the, the, the ABC or the Washington Post cases, it's not a sort of send the person in to commit you know, this undercover reporting and then bring them back out again in a short amount of time. This is a sustained operation. This is a business uh, that they're running. Um, so it's not, it's, it's, all the problems of it then are also sort of amplified uh, by the fact that it's done over a long period of time. On the other side, on the benefit side of this, um, they unequivocally uncovered clear corruption um, in the local government. Um, they wrote it and presented it in such a way that it was utterly impossible to ignore. Um, it was just a huge uh, national story as well as a huge Chicago story. And they got action. Um, inspectors uh, who were identified in this uh, were suspended, or I'm sure in many cases fired. There were uh, revisions of rules. The city of Chicago, which had been you know, sort of adamantly denying that there was this kind of corruption, now was really forced to reckon with it. Um, an interesting little epilogue to this case. Uh, this. Uh, story came just at that moment. Remember, I was describing for you a moment or a moment ago that the, the undercover reporting has sort of been on the wane in newspapers and on the increase in TV. This story ca came at a moment where it was just starting to sort of lose favor uh, in newspapers, um, and to, to many people's great surprise, it did not win a Pulitzer Prize. Um, and partly it didn't because Ben Bradley, who authorized Ben Bagdikian uh, to go into the prison system. But after that, really had a change of heart and, and you know, said the words that I read to you earlier about the, the impropriety of deception and reporting, that Bradley was very influential with the Pulitzer Committee um, in those days. And uh, he is said to have personally opposed giving the Sun-Times to the, the prize in this case, and it didn't get it. So the Sun-Times, in some ways, commits the, the splashiest act of un undercover reporting of its era and isn't rewarded for it by the journalism establishment because the, the kind of assumptions of the journalism establishment, particularly with respect to newspapers, were changing at just that moment. Um, so again, I guess I would ask the question of all of you, you know, imagine you're an editor at a big city newspaper and a couple reporters come to you and say, we need $5,000 to go open a bar so that we can snag a bunch of inspectors um, because we've heard about corruption. Um, setting aside whether you have $5,000 to give them, um, is that, a, is that a useful piece of reporting? Is that a laudable ethical ed enterprise? Yeah. I think in a way, um, starting with their own business is kind of like making it very like entangled and messy. I think maybe they could do it in a different way by going to like a business who, maybe not, not creating it, their own business. I think that makes it, the ethical issue even more uh, confusing because I think they're creating this place. They're kind of setting people up in a, in a place that they wouldn't normally be, whereas they could go to a business that already mm -hmm. exists instead mm -hmm. and still get the same result. I mean, one of the issues and this is an issue for law enforcement as well as for journalists who are engaged in this kind of practice, is are you capturing something that would happen if you weren't there, or are you inducing people to do something that they wouldn't otherwise do? And we'll catch, talk about this a lot in the case of To Catch a Predator. But, um, you know, do uh, 
And, and I think you're right that creating the business at least creates the possibility that you are you know, kind of luring people in a way that it might not be the case if you went and reported on another business. On the other hand, just in terms of storytelling, it offers you a lot of advantages because it means you can put your photographers up in the loft and you can, and you can tell a story in a way that is, as I said, impossible to ignore in a way that it might be drier if you did it off a different one. Yes? In most of these cases, I tend to think the end justifies the means. But um, in this particular case, it kind of seems like journalist is, is, becomes too big a part of the story. There's no, they, they made themselves a story here, yes. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. And they're, they're not. That is, by the way, almost always the case with undercover reporting. That because of the nature of it, there's something so sort of, you know, spy versus spy about it that it feels like, um, even if you don't do it intentionally, that the, that the act of the undercover act is so secretive and sort of, you know, sexy that that becomes a big part of the story. So I think that's a running issue with investigative or with undercover reporting. Um, I don't really know the exact uh, like people they were bribing or what the bribes were, but I feel like it's not really as much of public importance. Just because I feel like a lot of public, especially business owners, are like extremely frustrated with the strict standards that really maybe aren't that big of a, like a mm. like a health hazard, and so people are less concerned. Like okay, so a uh, gym where I used to live just got shut down because they didn't have an elevator for mm -hmm. handicap and. They had stairs, but like they see it as you know, this isn't a big deal because they're right. not coming here anyway. So standards like that, maybe. The I would yeah, I would agree that I'm sure that there are a range or were a range of opinions about the adequacy of inspections in Chicago in the late '70s. But I would also say this: I'll bet that for every uh, business owner who felt that the inspections were too strict or, or arbitrary, that there was another that objected to having to pay a bribe to get it, um, and you know. You can be sure that if a tavern like this burned down and it turned out that there had been no ventilation or fire inspection or that the inspector had been bought off, that the, the, the dial would tip the other way. And we'd instead be writing about the fact that the inadequacy of inspections or the, or the ability to bribe your way out of them did in fact create a public hazard. Different than your gym example, but you could imagine hypotheticals in the other way, you know? Yes? If you said that they actually opened it and ran it for a while, wouldn't that be uh, illegal on their part, knowingly opening a place that they knew was not safe? Uh, I'm quite sure that there's a, <laughs> that there is some illegal activity on their part here, yes. In fact, there's a, uh, I forget precisely the circumstances, but in November they went ahead and sold it. And when they sold it, they warned the new owner that they had to fix all these code violations that they'd allowed to persist. So they did at least their best in handing it off to kind of extricate themselves from that problem. But that whole, you know, if they had a, a First of all, bribing people is illegal, which they were doing. Um, and operating a facility where you know to have code violations is probably also illegal. Well, if there was a fire in that time that they'd operated, that would have created the biggest? I'm guessing that in the newsroom that there, were a lot, there was a lot of lost sleep over that question. Because if that place burned down uh, during this period, this story would come out real differently. Um, you know, I, I have no insight into how they handled those questions, but, um, but those would be questions you would certainly want to ask yourself. Um, Yes. Yeah, also, just because the journalists were so involved, I almost feel like they could have persuaded the inspectors even farther than like a normal business owner because they were trying to get a certain answer out of them. So they could have really been pushing mm -hmm. for them, you know, to be bribed, and maybe an inspector who hadn't been bribed before mm -hmm. was bribed. Was yeah, the same issue that sort of goes to right. Before. Yeah, the that's the question of sort of entrapment and inducement here. Um, you know, I will say this, uh, and based on nothing other than reading the series, it doesn't look like they had to work very hard. <laughs> but, uh, but you're right. I mean, they have a, a different kind of incentive to get someone to take a bribe than a normal business owner would. Why don't we do one more? Yes, please. Yeah, I think that um, they, they did immerse themselves too much into the story, but I think there's a big difference as to where if the, re if the reporter, you know, is looking at it and is like, oh, you have all these code violations, but, you know, we could work something out what, rather if they entrap them and be like, Oh, you know, if I give you some money, can you look over it? You know, that's right. like two different, it's two completely different things to whether right. the re, the reporter is suggesting a bribe or whether the inspector suggests a bribe. And again, I would say that 
I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that in those days that in Chicago you didn't have to suggest very hard, but you're absolutely right. Um, okay, uh, we have a minute or two. Let me just say, I handed you out that piece uh, last week. I know it's very long, um, but you don't need that for Thursday. That'll be for next, next week where we're going to talk about the business of journalism. Uh, just to give you a heads up, a week from Thursday, uh, I'm expecting a former colleague of mine, Henry Weinstein, to come join us and talk about the business of journalism. So if you'll have that David Shaw piece on the Staples episode read for next week, I just want to give you extra time on it. Um, and then for Thursday, if you'll come having watched some of those clips from To Catch a Predator and from the farmer or the uh, food market uh, thing, we'll be prepared to talk about those. And I'll talk about active and passive deception then, too. Great. Thank you. <clears throat>